know who used to shove it. Man! Today, in celebration of Rob Van Dam going into the WWE Hall of Fame, I thought I'd do a special video dedicated to Rob. With that in mind, I've got a factoid for all you little guys. I'm a fan of Vince Russo, and he's actually my granddaughter. I also have a boil on my ass. Alright, alright, enough screwing around. Have you ever heard of BVD? What about NJR? You haven't? You call yourselves wrestling fans? Oh, I'm gonna get some hate for this one. It's irrelevant because this one is purely based on facts. For one year, there was one TNA wrestler who won as much as Slap Nuts in his reign of terror, more than Triple H during his reign of terror, and more than John Cena during most of his best years. It's Rob Van Dam, or as I like to call him, Bob Van Dam, or No Job Rob. And of course, that's for good reason. And with RVD going into the Hall of Fame, I didn't think it would be right to overlook this path of destruction. This is a new series where we take a look into a year of a wrestler's career. So sit back, neck a beer, you little guys got nothing to fear. Let's find out if it was a year to cheer, or should I throw myself off of the pier? When Rob Van Dam signed for TNA in 2010, I was genuinely excited for it. Yes, TNA had made a lot of questionable signings in 2010, but for me this one was different. We had a guy who could have been more in WWE if he'd played his cards differently. He wasn't completely over the hill, he might still have a point to prove. This was comparable to Kurt Angle's signing for TNA. They were both around 4. The difference is that Kurt Angle had already proved his value to TNA by 2010. Would RVD live up to the same standards? Well let me tell you shove it squad, there's a reason that I call him no job Rob. Stay tuned and let's find out what he got up to. And if you don't do that, I'll hit you with a brick. So, as previously mentioned, RVD joined TNA when they were about to go head-to-head -head in the failed Monday Night Wars with the WWE. It was hoped that his signing along with Jeff Hardy and the Hawk would help bring more eyes to the product. I've made a video on the entire war, so check it out. I'm not going to promote it any more than that though, because I don't get paid a single pound for that video. That was like the first year of my channel's work, 4 hour video, that Monday Night War video can shove it. I tried fighting copyright for ages, but sometimes you just gotta let it slide and not be too greedy. Know when you're beaten. And trust me, the Hawk ain't beaten often. One major thing that came out of the Monday Night Wars video that I was not aware of before starting it was that RVD went undefeated for the entirety of it. The only time Rob got bad in TNA was quite literally on the night of his debut. He beat Sting in a 10 second match, and then he got hit with a baseball bat 20 times by the Stinger. The beating itself went way longer than the match, so you could forget that match even happened. This was a pretty dumb debut. One second we were all jumping up and down with excitement at RVD's surprise appearance at TNA, and the next minute he's on the floor getting smashed with a bat. Despite this obvious aggression, RVD would never seek revenge on the Stinger. However, something that came from this moment. RVD vowed that he'd never let anybody in TNA ever beat him this way again. And this is where it all went downhill, on the night of his debut. Rob was a changed man after this. This moment scarred him forever. And may I say, it even planted some seeds for him to change into Bob Van Dam. Van Dam beat his way through the TNA originals in 3 minute matches with none of them able to put up much of a fight against him. Beer money were his biggest victims. No Job Rob's first pay per view was against Cowboy James Storm. They were feuding because James Storm did the J.O.B. cleanly to Rob on TV, and then after the match he was a bad loser and hit Rob with his beer bottle. So now they must fight on pay-per-view, even though Rob's already proven that he can put away Storm quite easily. So it's lockdown 2010, and RVD has to pull double duty wrestling two matches on the same show. Storm wrestles Rob in the opener, and Storm barely landed a punch. That is despite Rob being split open for the entire match. The only way he could damage Rob was by cheating. So of course Rob wins. And then in the main event, Rob was on the winning team again in lethal lockdown. Van Damme then joined Hogan's boys, which was a group of wrestlers that didn't fit in very well together. It was Hogan, RVD, Hardy and Abyss who was their driver. This was not an official faction, but it certainly seemed like it was. Every member of the group was given a huge push and endorsement from the Hawk, and the fact that they were given such a big push and they were beating up TNA Originals made them feel even more dislikable. I soon told these guys to shove it. Hogan even went as far as christening RVD as Mr. TNA. They actually had him announced out to the ring like this. It was so forced and such an undeserved title, he'd done nothing to deserve it. Surely stars would be Mr. TNA. TNA soon had a decision to make. Were they going with Hardy or RVD as the main eventer? The two faced off in a number one contenders match on free TV. Why? And RVD came out victorious, so I guess they made their decision. At the time, AJ Styles was the world champion, but I guess his gimmick as Ric Flair's impersonator in part of the Grey Crew wasn't bringing in enough viewers, so they had RVD beat him for the belt in about 10 minutes on free TV. This should have been on pay-per-view, 
they wasted what was seen as a dream match by many people. TNA just loved to tip money down the drain like this. They were obsessed with the weekly TV ratings. Well, after watching it back, if this was a dream match for you, then you've never been punched in the gut so hard. And what I mean by that is that we all thought it would be much better than this. Rob beat him fairly easily, but just to be clear, it wasn't really a burial. This was more of a case of TNA fans being upset about Rob Van Dam being given the title and the branding as Mr. TNA. This was despite everything AJ had done for the company up to this point. But what follows is certainly a burial. First title defence for Rob was against Desmond Wolfe. Wolf had been big on the independent scene in ROH as Nigel McGuinness, and he was finally getting a shot with a larger audience. He started off in 2009 with a real hot feud with Kurt Angle, but the downfall of Desmond Wolf in TNA was short, ugly and sharp like a stuffed car. TNA were doing this little ranking system and fans were given the vote on who they'd like to see challenge for the world title. It was hoped by the Grey crew that the Golden Boy Abyss would win the vote, but the fans backlashed against Hogan's hero, and instead they voted for Desmond Wolf. He won the vote by a mile, and Tino were forced to acknowledge that. They sort of gave him his shot. They didn't actually admit he'd won by a landslide on the show, but they did give him a shot. Well, guess what? It didn't go well. They also did tell us that Abyss came dead last in the poll. There was no entrance for Wolf in the match, he just appeared, shoved in the ring. From there on, it was never in doubt. In fact, the whole match made Wolf look stupid as he spent the majority of the match pulling wacky faces into the camera. He was beaten by RVD in about three minutes in a throwaway match on TV and would never challenge for the world title again. It didn't take long for the fan vote to disappear from the show after this, as fans continued to vote for choices that were unpopular with the Grey Crew. RVD still had the small matter of an AJ Styles rematch which produced probably the best match of RVD's TNA career, but he did retain the belt. The match took place at Sacrifice 2010, and whilst it was a long match, it still wasn't a 5 star classic that you might have hoped for. So TNA management clearly decided that Rob was the draw to lead them against the WWE by putting the belt on him and having him win every match. Then TNA quickly threw in the towel and surrendered the Monday Night War, but they still had Rob as a champion. But just because the Monday Night War came to an end, that didn't mean his winning streak did. Yes, Rob had been undefeated for the entire war, but I'm in no means blaming Rob for TNA losing the war. I started to wonder why Rob's win record in TNA isn't really talked about. Well, it's probably because it was for a shorter amount of time and his matches didn't all end with, and then there was a ref bump, followed by a guitar shot. Plus, Rob's pretty popular on the internet compared to a Triple H or a John Cena. And it goes without saying, slap nuts. Well, slap me in my nuts if you don't like it. I wasn't a fan of this run. Rob's first loss came on impact in a triple threat match with a ref bump, interference, and AJ cheating with his feet on the ropes. Although this was far from a clean loss, this clearly got the wheels in motion, because that night, when RVD went home that night, he looked in the mirror and he made himself a promise. He would never go down so easily again, especially to a TNA original. They just weren't worthy of beating him, and he would not do the J.O.B. for another five months. Next up, Sting would be beaten by RVD, but they weren't feuding over the fact that Sting beat Rob out of a bat months earlier. No, no. Instead, Sting came first in the top 10 ranking system. This was completely fabricated and it was supposed to be Matt Morgan, but instead Bischoff said that the fan poll would now only merely be a portion of how the number one contendership would be picked. I don't know if it was the fact that it was a man in his 40s versus a man in his 50s, but it wasn't very good and didn't get me excited to watch any of their main events. RVD won the match and kept his belt. Rob carried on being a fighting champion as TNA stupidly gave away his match against Samoa Joe in a throwaway TV match. This could have been a great and solid pay-per-view match, but no, RVD beat Joe in about 10 minutes. Another example of Samoa Joe getting pushed further down the card as more WWE guys came into TNA. Something started to feel strange. I'd watched all these matches of Rob vs Jerry Lynn and ECW, I'd watched Rob be the breakout star of the Invasion storyline in 2001, and I watched that match with Cena in the WWE, and that was all great. But something was off with these matches. They were all just average. He was no longer the younger guy being held down. He was the established wrestler with the grey bosses behind him, holding down the guys who were younger than him. Rob then defended the title in a four-way match, and it still didn't look like he'd be losing anytime soon. Then the ECW guys arrived in TNA for the 59th time, and of course Rob would be a part of that kind of invasion storyline. He went off and tried to recreate some of the magic with Sabu, it wasn't too bad, but they were both a lot older, and it wasn't the same. They tried to have a match from 1997 in 2010, needless to say RVD won again. Also Abyssomania had ended, and Abyss had turned back into being a monster again, thank god, and now he was obsessed with a stick covered in nails that he called Janice. Abyss and Janice would be the next two to go up against Rob for his title. The feud was mostly Abyss getting battered by 50 ECW guys at once, and it made Rob look weak and dislikable, despite that he was supposed to be a good guy. It all came to a head on the whole effing show. 
Yeah, TNA gave Rob his own TV special. It wasn't actually a pay-per-view though. It was a stairway to Janice match. A hardcore match with Abyss's stick hanging in the air. The stipulation is that the winner gets to murder the loser with the bat. RVD won the match as expected, and it was one of the few times we got to see the hardcore RVD that we were expecting to see. So he didn't drop the belt, but in the end Abyss hit him with the stick. Sort of. It wasn't shown. RVD was lying on the floor dead covered in blood backstage. He looked like he'd been mutilated by Abyss. This would turn out to be the end of Rob's world title reign, as Rob was sent to hospital with 117 stitches, punctured organs and head trauma. Jesus, why isn't Abyss being arrested for attempted murder? Bischoff tells RVD that the show must go on, and because he's going to be in hospital for a while he's vacating the world title. In real life, RVD was tired and he was taking some time off from TNA, despite him only being in the company for 6 months and not really wrestling regularly since leaving WWE 2 years earlier. The man's entitled to a break, ok it's not his fault, I'm sure that's just the contract he signed, to have a certain amount of dates, but he could have at least dropped the world title to Abyss. Abyss could have really used the belt to help people to start taking him seriously. Instead now they all feel like I do, he's an idiot. I'll forgive you for forgetting that RVD even existed in TNA past this point, because it was all just a pointless waste of time. He still had over 2 years left in TNA, what on earth did he spend the rest of his time doing? RVD came back into TNA in October, but Bischoff and Hogan were now the bad guys so RVD was going to go against the establishment. This would hopefully make him a bit more likeable. RVD's stoner friend Jeff Hardy was now a bad guy, so RVD was feeling pretty lonely and betrayed. Rob wanted his title back and he communicated this through some of the worst promos you've ever seen. RVD hasn't exactly ever been the strongest promo guy, but the company was being built around him and these promos were just not acceptable for the self-proclaimed Mr. TNA. He was forced to face Anderson in a number one contenders match, which would be thrown out, so there's still no second loss for Rob. Well, I wouldn't have to wait much longer, because that incredible moment was just one week later. Rob was teaming with his old ECW friend against Beer Money. Sar Bold threw a chair at Rob by accident, and this is how he lost his second TNA match. From then on RVD became completely distracted from recapturing his world title, and instead got wrapped up in the ECW invasion storyline. This is where he suffered his third loss, as he was continuously screwed and left in handicap situations. In fact, the month of November would not be a good one for Rob. Although none of the losses were clean, first of all he was pinned by AJ, where Rob was left in a handicap situation. He was then pinned yet again by Styles in a sloppy triple threat match, where he was distracted by the ECW guys. This time it was Rhino. I think Rob needs to stop living in the past man. Four losses. Rob also strangely lost to Kazarian after a ref bump and interference from Rhino. He thought Rhino was his friend because, you know, they'd been in ECW together. Haven't you ever heard that before? So not a good November, but to have a perfect year is hard. And when you're Mr. TNA, you have to come back more determined. You have to make sure that once you've done the JOB, that you don't lose at all the following month. Rob finished up his ECW feud by beating his ex-friend Rhino. Again, it's fair enough really, no one really wanted to see Rhino in 2010 winning on pay-per-view. That ship had sailed 8 years before. Next up, Rob suffered another loss, this time to... Rob Terry. No, I'm just kidding you. That one never happened. For God's sake, can you imagine? Now, RVD beat him pretty easily. His final match of 2010 was against another guy who's most definitely in the shove-it zone. Robbie E. He tried to fist pump with RVD before the match, but RVD's just no fun. Yeah, RVD beat him in about 2 minutes, and I'm not suggesting he shouldn't have, because it's Robbie E who's afraid of clowns. And he is a clown. So that's how his 2010 would end. There was another match against... <sighs> Slapnuts. This was recorded in 2010, but didn't air to 2011. And it was actually a loss, so shove it if you will. But I'm not including it, because a fan at home wouldn't know that, would they? So that's how he became No Job Rob, by losing just 5 matches in an entire calendar year. Three of the times to AJ Styles, and not one of the losses was clean or some way convincing in the least. There's nothing wrong with strong booking, in fact I agree with it. If you want to make someone look like a threat they must be booked strong. It was just the way that he lost his matches. No one else needed constant shenanigans to let Rob beat them. So he finished on a 75% winning percentage. That also includes a battle royal and a couple of matches that were thrown out. So really it's more like 80%. The matches he were having were okay, but they weren't as good as you would have hoped for from RVD. And the way he just went home for two months and didn't drop the belt to Abyss. It just seemed pointless. Why not do it? It would have really helped him, you know? So the main victims of No Job Rob would be AJ Styles, Beer Money, Samoa Joe, and most definitely the idiot Abyss. Trust me, with those rotten teeth his own wife won't even give him a kiss. Do you know it was ironic? 
In the end, RVD would suffer someone else not doing the J.O.B. for him. They'd been building up that storyline with Jeff Hardy for ages, how they were best friends and Jeff had turned heel and gone against everything that he believed in. You know, weed, pills, partying, the Hawkster. And they built up the feud for almost the entire year, but then Victory Road happened, and Jeff Hardy would never face RVD properly in a blow-off match. So not everything went as planned for No Job Rob. And that's 2010, the year No Job Rob was born. We'd have to wait a bit longer for him to become Bob Van Damme, but that's a story for another day. And if you don't agree with that, I'll make you spray. 